Welcome to The Inevitable. This is Motor Trend's new podcast about the future of the automobile. I am Johnny Lieberman, the senior features editor at Motor Trend, and I am joined every week by my co-host, Mr. Ed Lowe. That's me. I'm the head of editorial for Motor Trend, and boy, do we have an amazing list of guests that we're going to be chatting with. We've got the godfather of the environmental movement, Ed Bagley Jr. Derek Jenkins, a whole bunch of actors, celebrities, car crazy folks, people from in and outside the industry. Can't wait for you to join us. We're talking about the future of the car. This means everything from electrified vehicles to cars that drive themselves. Come check us out. We're on podcastone.com or anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. We're also on motortrend.com and youtube.com slash motortrend. Hey guys, we've got a great car cast episode. We're going to dig into this documentary about Goldberg playing on A&E, and then we're going to touch on the Ford Raptor R and the Chevy Blazer EV. Before we get started, here's Geico. Do you own? Do you rent your home? Sure you do. And it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling your policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you have so much to do already around your home. Why not make it easy? Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Hey, guys. Welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the moderator, DeAndre, here with Bill Goldberg. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just call me call me Mr. Zoom. Mr. Zoom. I know that uh, you've been doing back-to-back interviews for days on end. Uh, here we are in the morning here, West Coast time, and uh, you're, I don't know, three or four <laughs> interviews already into it. And it's really all about this uh, this documentary, this WWE like Legends documentary. It's a great series that A and E has on their network, and they they did the documentary about you. I watched it. I thought it was great. Uh, uh, ben did a little research and found out that it is playing in its entirety on the website. I'm sure there's replays on A and E. On the network, so you can just uh, look for it that way. But uh, if you go to, I think it's AETV dot com. Um, they uh, we clicked on it. They had the full, you know, almost two hour episode up there, so you can stream it and watch it. It's it's fascinating. It's a fascinating story, and and I get with a lot of of the performers in WWE. They've all got their unique story and. That industry is weird because, you know, it wasn't always big. You know, back in the day, there was wrestlers like, you know, you you get your ass kicked and you, you know, you you get a hundred bucks, right? And, and and that's it. And it's turned into, it's turned yeah, into. There, there, back, in the day, there, back in the day, there were a lot of wrestlers that got their ass kicked, got handed a hundred bucks and then went to another job as a bouncer. Yeah. Right. So, right. And of course yeah. had to do other stuff. Right. Uh. You know, now I would say that this this A and E doc, it's great, but the A and E doc is is WWE legends. So they they started by touching on your football career because that's an important part of your vision for yourself at a young age. Played college ball, made it to the NFL, which wasn't that easy, right? It's kind of a layup. Tried for the Rams, and then the Rams a couple times, and then and then they kind of breezed over your actual NFL career because they were trying to get to the you know become a wrestler portion of it. But there's an NFL career there. There's an actual NFL career that I don't know that all the WWE fans. So they kind of breezed over that, and then there was you know. There was the WCW, WWE, and then there was 12 years, and then WWE, but they kind of breezed over like the 12 years. They were like, well, it's been 12 years. Should we bring them back? And they're like, well, what should we do during those 12 years? And it's like, well, there's been a film career. There's been an acting career. There's been a, Japan's been wrestling around the world. There's, you know, there's been, there's been a lot more to the story than what's just in the documentary. So that being said, this is a great d- documentary from a WWE perspective, right? From and, and being that it bought 
WCW. This is the life of of Bill Goldberg in WCW and WWE, that life. And understandably, that makes sense. That's what they wanted to portray. There's a lot more to it. You don't get an opportunity to go through everything in, you know, a hundred and, you know, whatever, an hour and 44 minutes or 88 minutes of, of an actual airtime once you read out commercials. But, um, but good. I thought overall they, they did a good job. Uh, we saw some goats. We saw some dogs. <laughs> I'll, I'll make I'll make appearances. Um, I I was a little uh, shocked that um, when they were getting in to the most recent days of WWE, they 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 built up the you know you went back for Wanda and Gage. They never got a chance to see you wrestle live. And then you know, seeing Gage in the ring with you, uh, but they didn't. They didn't like kind of pass on the torch. Not that saying that Gage is going to be a wrestler, but in the ring as a teenager and Bobby Lashley and performing a little, you know, it it kind of opened the door up to a generation sequel. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know why they didn't touch on that for ninety seconds at least. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's weird. I mean, quite quite obviously produced by WWE and A and E uh, in conjunction. But I mean, it's a, it's again another one of those stories that's that's compiled through past memories that has a story to it, and there's a reason for it to start and end the way that it did. Yeah, uh, there I, there were quite a few things left out. There's no question about that. There's a lot of aspects of my life, as you pointed out, 12 years away, that they could have touched on, but it would have been a six hour biography, right? You know, uh, uh, document or di- uh, documentary, as opposed to you know the hour 44 that it was. I think they did a pretty good job. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think a lot of people understand a lot more about me than they did in the past because it's coming from me. Uh, I quite honestly did not show anybody anything of my personal life that I did not want to show them. My garage, my house, my cars, my, you know, everything, all the animals around here. I just, I'm, I still am a private guy, man. So I don't, Yeah, I was very controlled. And that the content wasn't any different than what I wanted it to be. I mean, I'm not here showing off what I've attained in the wrestling business because, you know, I, I stole from, it. you know, I, I, I looked at it as a business and I wanted to earn a living and be able to take care of my family. And I didn't show the benefits of what I've acquired throughout the years, but that's not the time and or place to do it, nor is any other time or place. Um, the reason why I do the things that I do are for myself and I don't do them for other people. And therefore I don't advertise them a lot. So the, the documentary in that respect was very good in that it, it let people in, but it did not really show them much. You know? I, I agree with that. And, and sitting over here in this studio where, you know, where Adam Krola's production company is and having been a part of the documentaries, there's a difference between a good documentary and a reality show. The reality show, you know, even a two-hour one-off reality program is is a lot of you walking around your property and showing off your cars and 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 you know, you know, you know, just memorabilia around the house and stuff. That's not what this is. This is a this is a WWE wrestling documentary. This is about you and your wrestling career. So I thought in that regard, it was it was done. It was done well. It told a good story there. Is there is there anything sure. in is there is there anything in the documentary that you feel like you should comment on? Is there anything that you saw that uh, made a good point and you want to stress that point, or something that you felt like sure. wasn't really told correctly and you might have thoughts on that? Is, is there is there anything in that in that A and E doc that? Uh, you know, do you watch it and yeah, go, well, I, I kind of wish this or they did a good job here? 
I think they did they they did a really good job of capturing me and my thought process, me and my reality of how I look at the business, some timelines. You know, the, it, it, it's it's tough to accomplish what they ultimately want to accomplish with a story and a character such as myself. And as you noticed, I don't know if you did or not, there's like no end to it. There's no finality to it. There's no, well, you're done. There's no, you know, there's no, it doesn't lead to anything else. It's just like, okay, we're stopping the story right here. There's, there's really no end to it because I'm still under contract. Right? Yeah, right. And you're still, you're still part of the, you're, you're still on the roster. I mean, they kind of try to do like, hey, now, now we're at the Hall of Fame and you're there with your family. And uh, I thought your message, your Hall of Fame speech was, was very good, a great message, very passionate toward the WWE fans. Uh, and you've been saying that throughout the entire documentary. It's a different NFL fan base for the, for the most part. It's a, it's a younger kind of superhero-esque, you know, like look up to, you know, we love this character. We love that the way the, way the character progresses. It's different when you're – when you were playing football, football fans would look up to you or pay attention to you based off of your ability and your your stats, and that's real life. The wrestling world is interesting. It's a character that you try to develop, but it is still a acting job right it's there's there's still scripts there's still things going on right so uh when you watch the documentary and you see a rise in stardom you get that with a good actor you get that with a good performer somebody who's charismatic and physically in this case physically in in the ring and then you know the storyline kind of weans out and fans start to turn a little bit but we get good guys and bad guys all the time right but some of the some of the controversy that they try to build into a documentary. Um, the big thing there was Bret Hart. Uh, so here's a question: uh, Do you have a relationship with Bret Hart uh, these days? Um, is there any conversations with Bret Hart? Is is where are you guys? You and Bret? Uh, uh, I could care less about what Bret Hart thinks. For the rest of my life, that's where I am with Bret Hart. Okay, fair. <laughs> I'm I'm done and over with saying I'm sorry. Those days are fucking over with. Yeah. Okay. So I beat it into the ground so long. I you can only say you're sorry so many times. They can all kiss my ass from now on because that that part of Goldberg's done. If you can't accept that, then it ain't my problem anymore. Right. Okay. So there was a conversation, like you said, you apologized. This is the storyline. This is what happened. And it happened. Right. And, uh, you know, tragedy in this business happens all the time. Right. Um, in this particular case, Bret Hart feels like uh, he took sort of a career damaging, maybe not career ending blow in this match. But that's that. But you know, other things have happened in the wrestling world as well. There's been, you know, there's been some <coughs> people have died in, in, you know, performing, you know, there's some, it's a, it's a massive show. It's a massive stunt show. There's lots of things going on. There's lots of innovation, you know, flying through the air and, and ladders and chairs and, you know, and things. So, all right. I, I, I think that's enough. I think it's enough. I think it's enough said on that. Um, what are your thoughts on on there was a good point that was brought up. I don't I don't remember if it was uh who brought it up specifically in in the doc, but with the internet all these sort of behind the scenes things can kind of reveal themselves before it even happens. So you know, you, you see this in, in Hollywood as well. Hollywood tries to be very close to the vest. They don't want to ruin, you know, a, a film or a TV show or a season finale. You know, they always try to keep it close to the vest and do whatever. But And there's, there's always 
Reddit forums and stuff that have a lot of speculation, maybe something leaked, there's some rumor and stuff. But do you think that in the wrestling world that is more prevalent? Uh, do you think – you know, when when you sign an agreement and it's you wrestle, I don't know, three times a year, or two times a year, and the internet knows that. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you have thoughts on that? I mean, I think it kind of takes something away, but also, you know, it's it's not it's not you, it's not WWE, it's not the contract, it's it's the people kind of digging around and spreading that news, like like it's some controversial, huge big deal you know like <laughs> people in the wrestling business or people in the wrestling business are extremely rabid about information and anytime anything gets out there that they could remotely twist and turn into a different storyline they do it's all about being the first guy to tell everybody that you know something that other people don't know yeah i personally believe that the wrestling business has has fallen by the wayside because of the internet um there needs to be secrecy there needs to be there doesn't need to be cameras and or reporters in the locker room telling everybody every behind the scenes everything leading to conjecture either this way or that way but it's progress it's the age of information yeah it, it is what it is but I personally believe that the wrestling business has taken a huge hit and has gone by the wayside because of the internet. Well, I, and I, because of most of the morons that are on there spreading bullshit. Right. I think it kind of takes away some of the fun of it. You know, we. You know, Absolutely. I, I mean, like, look, like a like a lot of us that enjoy a film or a TV show, you know. Uh, we've all kind of said it. We're like, I didn't watch that episode yet. I'm not going to get on Twitter. Like, I don't want to, don't ruin it for me. Or even a game. You're like, oh, I, I recorded a game and, yeah. and I, I don't want to know what happened. Like, I'm just going to stay off the internet for a minute so I could. And I do appreciate the fans that are a little more like that. Like, I enjoy the wrestling or you watch a TV show or you watch a game and you go, ah, I got to stay off the internet until I watch it because I want to have the fun and seeing it. I don't want to see the spoilers before it happens. And I don't want to know what happens at the end. I really yeah. don't. I, I want to be inter- and be able to guess what happens, not someone tell me. And, you know? I, and I, know, I know the organization tries to put a little effort into that. Okay, so you sign a deal or somebody else signs a deal and you're obligated to a certain amount of matches or appearances. But also... Uh, you know, as frustrating as it is for you as a performer, you know, it's not like you sign a contract in October and then they go, you're going to be in the ring April 15th and November 1st. And like, like, great. Right, that'd be, that'd be fantastic for you to know that, but you don't know that. You don't know that until somebody, you know, somebody on staff, maybe Vince McMahon, like sends you a text message or gives you a call like, Hey, Bill. You know, it's never like, hey, what are you up to? You know, you got some time in five weeks or four weeks. It's just like you're coming in you're Sunday night. You know, you're coming in. So there is a little bit of that. So, you know, these these contracts and stuff that they do, I get it. There's licensing and branding and likeness and toys and the names and all that stuff. But for the most part, it's it's an agreement to be on call. It's yeah, it's, I love the way you put that. You're 100% right. It's an agreement to be on call. Now, you can always ask for a favor and go, this isn't the best day. You know, can we push a week? What does that do to the storyline? But for the most part, it it needs to be a lucrative enough agreement that any other job you take, that WWE stipulation takes precedence. So if you go to Hollywood to do a film or you're doing a TV show or you're on the Goldbergs again or NCIS Los Angeles, all of those guys, if they want you, they need to, they need to know that I am down. I want to work. I want to do the TV show, but just know at any given moment, I could get a call or a text message and I'm going to have to leave. Now, it doesn't mean I need to leave right that second, but it could mean I need to leave in three weeks from now. And I know that fucks up your schedule and I apologize, right? So- 100%. Every, every 
as long as I'm under contract for the WWE, every single thing takes a, a backseat. A backseat, right. Now, that exclusivity is worth something. It's worth something to anyone who has that type of employment agreement, right? So now, now that being said, let's let's stop. Let's the WWE fans. Let's stop talking about that and let's focus on the entertainment in in the ring. And if you do enjoy the lifestyle bit and the all the behind the scenes, then then watch the reality shows, whatever the Miz or or whoever's got the reality. You can do that as well. Watch the talk shows. Watch you know. Watch what Steve Austin's doing. Watch you know on on his. On his talk show, which and when we love Steve, he's charismatic. He's great. He lives and breathes his stuff, and uh, and he has a great time doing it. And I, he's the chattiest motherfucker I know, <laughs> and I, I love that about about Steve. <laughs> and I know you're grinning, you're laughing. You can't see it on the podcast here, but <laughs> but I have not had a less than forty minute conversation with with Steve Austin. And, and, possible. Yeah, like when you see his name pop up on your phone, you're like, "This is going to take a minute," and and I enjoy it, but you gotta, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take a minute. <laughs> yes. You know, it's gonna, gonna take a minute, and and it's always good because sometimes it's the business, sometimes it's cars and trucks and business and all that stuff, or beer or whatever, like all of the things that he's into. He loves to talk about. Um, um, anyway. Uh, on A and E Network, uh, it's the it's the uh, documentary, the WWE series that's up there. There's a lot of great episodes. Goldberg's episode. I think you guys, the fans that are listening to this podcast, uh, even if you're not super familiar with 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 Bill's wrestling uh, background, this is a this is a fun thing to watch. You get a, definitely an inside look as. Uh, the the trajectory of Bill the man and Goldberg the character, and uh, it's good. And like we said, it's on the A and E website. It looks like it's there in its entirety. I don't believe you need a subscription or even need to sign in. You can just watch it. At least that's what we just saw. So uh, check check that out. We appreciate it. And it was good. You guys did a great job. And the whole thing in there is is great. Thank you. Uh, Thank now you. can we get in? Uh, uh- about his uh, chubby little self being in the ring at six <laughs> years old, but uh, other than all his classmates, see it. but yeah, it's all good. I uh, I uh, I didn't want to bring it up, but yeah, I saw uh, I saw little Gage tearing his shirt off. His, his, girl, his girlfriend loved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which is it which is actually I was watching it um I was watching it with 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 Tammy and I said I go you know Gage is an all-star athlete right now and he was in the ring and he, you know cuz we were we were there in Vegas for for that portion of it and I go uh they didn't show they didn't show him th- that they go they they showed <laughs> young kind of plump Gage <laughs> and I go, well, why didn't they fast forward to, you know, a couple of years later where, you know, he's, you know, uh, you know, almost as, as tall as Bobby Lashley is in the ring. You know, obviously Lashley's a monster, but they didn't they didn't show that portion <laughs> of it. So, uh, they left out a lot. That's for sure. They left out a lot. But yeah. that, that's all. And it's good. It was it was fun to watch. All right, so now down to business. Raptor R? Can we talk Ford Raptor R finally? <laughs> Go ahead. I was waiting for this. Uh, I, again, as you and I have said, we love this rivalry between Ford Raptor and Ram and their TRX and uh, bringing the V8 back into the Raptor. Uh, you know, we talked about it a week ago. We were saying... You know, some of the car companies are having some fun and trying to go out with a bang, no pun intended, with big high horsepower cars before we get that stuff kind of taken away from us. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about the Dodge Challenger maybe going out on on a bang with an E85 version just from the factory. We thought somewhere around 800 and 800 horsepower. (laughs) Now we're thinking 909 horsepower. And I don't know. I think it's just because they wanted to go from – 808 to 909, you know, just to like turn it up a bit. Uh, 
And, and it's funny because it's like, it doesn't matter what the dyno numbers are because they're like, we'll just add 100 horsepower. We'll call it 909. It's probably more than that at the crank, and uh, we'll have some fun with it. So F- Ford is saying, well, uh, as much as we want everyone to buy an electric Ford Lightning, um, we might as well get some attention for ourselves and prove a point and do the Raptor R. Uh, as we expected, it's the supercharged V8. Uh, it's a version of the engine taken out of the, taken out of the GT500. Um, the car, which is 760 horsepower and I think 625 pound-feet of torque, in the truck it is 700 horsepower but 640 pound-feet of torque. They definitely did – uh, they made a few changes to to the truck. For for example, they went to from a, a tubular exhaust manifold to a cast manifold for durability. Um, so some exhaust changes and some tuning changes for more of that low end torque, uh, which uh, which I think is great. And look, seven hundred, seven oh seven. It's not enough to make a difference. You're you're a Canaan air filter away from basically being the same. Now, you're right, or the or you know, or or an exhaust system. Now we don't have the performance numbers on the vehicle. We've got some specs on it, which uh, we'll get into in a second. But the performance numbers we don't quite know yet. Uh, and every magazine out there, Edmonds, we'll talk to Alistair. They'll all put them up against each other. Raptor R versus TRX. Every publication is going to have that. And the results are going to vary slightly. But the Raptor is 400 pounds lighter, all the aluminum body and things like that. So we might end up seeing a difference there. But also, like, when you you got your, your TRX... It came with the 35s, and when you go to the 37s and you're swinging more of that weight around, that does make a difference because it's it's at the wheels. It's it's what you're moving around, right? So, And the Raptor R has got 37s on it. So, yeah, it's got some good torque and it's lighter weight, but where is the weight placed in comparison mm-hmm. to the TRX. Now, it wouldn't be a fair comparison against your TRX because you've got 37s. But if you go a factory TRX on 35s versus possibly the heavier wheel and tire combo of the Raptor R and 37s, uh, there could be a, a little bit horsepower being eaten at the at the axle, basically. So that was just one thing. Um, but anyway, as we said, it's got 37s, 700 horsepower, 640 pound feet of torque. It's got the uh, Fox uh, uh, active uh, suspension system on it. It's got the 10 speed select shift transmission. Uh, you know, and it's got a heavier duty um, uh, drive shaft and heavier duty. Uh, uh, torque converter. Um, there's a lot in there to to beef it up. The various modes: um, normal, sport, quiet, Baja with the uh, active exhaust system. All the fun things that we expect. Beefed up suspension. Um, it does have a little bit more uh, travel uh, overall um, when you compare it to to the TRX. But that's probably more of a function of the 37s than it is. Uh, anything uh, anything else. Um, we do have a little bit of a comparison here. Uh, the Raptor R being 5,950 pounds compared to 6,395 for the TRX. The TRX, 702 horsepower, 650 pound-feet of torque. We're talking just, you know, two horsepower difference and 10 pound-feet difference. So that's basically a push. Hey, before you, before you move on, realize that I think um, vehicles over six thousand pounds have a the ability to write them off as a farm implement. Yeah, farm equipment. You could lease it as a tractor. Not with the Raptor, then. Yeah, no, not with the Raptor. I guess not. You're right. If it's six thousand pounds, uh, they'd have to add fifty pounds. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's actually a good point if you're going to lease it. I think 6,000 pounds is the limit. You're going to have to check, though, and not all the states do it. In Texas, you can, but I'm not sure exactly what the the weight is. It 
it it might be a little less than six hundred six thousand in a few areas because I don't know what um what like a Range Rover weighs, but I know some or a Tahoe. I know some guys are doing. I'm that. not sure, but that will make a factor of being sold in Texas. I guarantee it. It will. I think it absolutely will. Um. Anyway, and overall. You know, as a Dodge guy, I mean, hell, I'm ecstatic that they're doing it because it means that the, there's a possibility that Dodge will counter with something more powerful. Right? right. All right. So that being said, more powerful is where we're heading next. If you've got a TRX, you've got a Raptor, chances are you've already done some modifications to it. That's just the enthusiast in us. Um, Whipple has already announced – the supercharger upgrade for the Raptor R. And you're going to get massive amounts of power out of it. And now you and I have been talking for a few weeks, um, both on and off the air, about compound boost, maybe putting turbos onto the TRX. Um, I believe next week we're going to be talking to Gail Banks about this. Uh, I tried to get him on this week, but he's been traveling. Uh, Now, I will preface that by saying... This could be an interesting conversation because Gail Banks, who's done a lot of testing to make that type of combination work, it doesn't necessarily work on a lot of the factory-built vehicles because it stresses the supercharger. That supercharger is not meant to get that pressure from that end, from the front end, and then put it into the engine. So he might have thoughts about that. So – as we talk about compound boost with him, we can ask him questions like, well, what if we just go turbo, take the supercharger off? Oh, and then also Whipple, I believe it's rumored. I don't know that it's been announced yet. We'll get some information. Whipple's got a big supercharger upgrade, direct replacement for the TRX, I believe. I'm just going to say that's probably going to happen <laughs> if you're uh, – uh, Yes. This is this is one of those times where the internet does come through for us, yeah. and and we are digging to get the spoiler alert. Uh, and, and I heard I heard uh, from yes, I heard from somebody extremely reputable that it's already available to certain. Things. I, I, I'm sure uh, some of the big sellers and installers, like maybe Gearhead Fabrications, that have a, a good relationship with. With Whipple and these companies, they they've probably got the inside line. They probably have already installed some to at least do testing and give feedback to uh, to Whipple. So that be one said, on the new tier. There'll be one on the new tier. Yeah. So that I I do want to have the conversation about compound boost. I am curious, and I've seen it done in a few places. I I'm not saying it wouldn't work and make big power. My question is, what's the longevity? What's the reliability of doing that type of setup? Well, that and also what's the efficiency of That's right. Like, is yeah. it, like Gail has done this in his racing programs, and I want to know why. Uh, did he do it just to try it? He's an innovator. He's got a million patents. Maybe he just wanted to try it. But maybe he you know, found something else. And I know he's experimented with – you know, turbos first, supercharger first, like all sorts of configurations and different type of superchargers and all kinds of stuff. And probably have blown up more engines than I can count because he, he, you know, you've got to stress test these things and figure it out. So looking forward to that interesting conversation, but also excited to see that, uh, that Whipple is, uh, and we should talk to somebody from Whipple as well um, to get their thoughts on, on a Whipple Raptor R versus a Whipple TRX. We're having conversations now about stock versus stock, but let's yeah. let's look at what I don't know, the nine hundred horsepower versions of these trucks, how they how they compete with each other. And then I guess how you're gonna use it, you know? Are you driving it around every day or are you 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 hitting the dirt every weekend? Well let's see. I've had the latest TRX for a couple I think three weeks and I've already got 2,500 miles on it. So let's just say that I'm using the shit out of this. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that's good. How many, how many miles are on your first edition? 
14,520. Oh, well, you got some miles on that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All and right. And there will be none, no more put on it. It, it, is, it is put away for the foreseeable future. Uh, okay, so let's talk but a little. I, hey, but yeah. Before before you get into the next subject, I have a question, um, and I think it's a question that that a lot of people are are mulling over right now. So, looking at the end of the ice era, yeah. What are what are the five cars that you're going to grab in the next year that you think are the ones? to be housed in the, you know, for the end of this era, you know, I mean, where do you, how do you, I mean, Dodge is coming out with something every six, every three months, it seems, you know, uh, a lot of people are coming out with what we think is the last hurrah and then they're trumped. Right. So yeah. it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you think or the name a couple that will be, I'm not going to say priceless, but are the ones to acquire in the next, you know, year or so. Right. So, and, but you're talking new cars. Like, what would you get for new yeah. cars? Because, you know, in the collector, well, yeah, it's, in the collector it's, car it's, world. It's, these companies are, 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 are lobbing up their last hurrah. What do you think are the ones that are going to be special 20 years from now? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. And, um, uh, you always got to take price into consideration, but there are there are there are a few thoughts it, that the, that the normal person can deal yeah, with. Right, nah, I mean, right. we're not talking supercars here. We're talking regular, you know, reg, you know, hundred thousand, well, you know, under under one hundred fifty thousand dollar car. Right, right. So, uh, my my initial thoughts on that would be, uh, you want to look at the vehicle, but as far as you want to look at the vehicle because you want something that's fun. But then you want to look at, uh, like you said, maybe 10, 20, 30 years down the road, what have you had fun with? And um, my my advice is you've got to look at the, the brand name, the model name. You've got to look at the history of that particular vehicle. You know, So I think if you grab – Something Shelby GT500, Shelby GT350-ish, Mustang Mach 1, there's a lot of history there. Dodge Challenger, there's a lot of history there. I think at the top of my list right now, if you could afford it, um, I say Corvette Z06. I think that Corvette Z06, the flat plane crank, naturally aspirated, uh, I think that is going to be a home run as far as the fun factor and really something special uh, and possibly very collectible. So I think that but, kind of horsepower. But herein, that lies, but herein lies another issue. Yeah. The other issue is when are they going to, who knows when the last one's going to be from each manufacturer? Because well, look at Dodge, right? Dodge is about to come out with the, with an E85 909 horsepower challenger. Well, is yeah. that going to be their last hurrah? Is that the one to grab? Is that, you know, and then three months, four months, six months down the road, you're like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have got that because they came out with something else, you know? And so your garage is going to be full of like 50 cars. Would you think it's well, the end of the era? And it's not. Okay, so what I would do is I would take away that aspect. I would take away trying to get the last one. I would try to get a cool one. Now, the Dodge Challengers that you have – you have various versions that were unique within a certain year period. You have Red Eye. You have Demon, right? Uh, and this, whatever they're going to call the E85 version, that's a cool one to get. Maybe there is something after it, but it won't be that car. It'll be something else of the Challenger. So you're not necessarily losing out, right? Now, if they do Demon 2.0, right, that would be a weird marketing move, right? Um, at this at this point, it would be a weird marketing move, 
Like we've seen the GT500 come and go a few times over the years. They go through the lineup. They bring back some legacy, but they don't want to do back to back, right? So we're getting a Corvette C8. We're getting a Z06. It is possible. We know we're going to get an EV version, right? They're already testing it. And the performance is going to be crazy. But the rumor is a, like a ZR1. And a ZR1 probably won't have the the naturally aspirated flat plane crank of the Z06, but it could be like a twin turbo version of, of the C8 we have now. So uh, to answer your question, I like the idea of a ZR1, but I like the idea of Z06 and financially you want to pick one or the other because you, unless you have a lot of money, but I don't think you'd go wrong with either one of those. You know, if you can get a Z06, great. If you find out later there's going to be a ZR1 that's twin turbo, maybe you want it. Maybe you can get it. Maybe you trade in your Z06 or maybe you're like, fuck it. I like my naturally aspirated flat plane crank version. You like the sound. It's cool. It's special. Here, Here's the example. I had a buddy of mine text me two days ago. Hey, there's a super stock, you know, a black super stock that's got no miles on it. It's in my area. They only made 120 super stocks. And he's all hot and heavy about going out and getting it. And two days later, there's a rumor of the E85 with 909 horsepower. I say, right? I it's say, 100, 100 more horsepower than the Superstar. And if you don't have all the money in the world, which one do you get? What do you do? How long do you wait? You know. So I mean, it's a it's a great time, but it's also a very confusing time as a collector. It is. I would say, first of all, you can't go wrong with the super stock for exactly why you just mentioned. There's only a handful. They didn't. They, it, it wasn't one of the wildly promoted ones out there because they knew it was going to be limited production. It mostly got into the front of collectors and, and longtime customers. You're not going to go wrong with that car. And if he's got the means to get that car, then I would say go ahead and get it. And look, if if you decide you don't like it or you decide you really want the E85 version – uh, of the car right now under current market conditions you'll do fine you can trade it you can sell it you can put it on bring a trailer i don't know how sustainable this market is we could be looking at a recession maybe later this year beginning of next year i think values are going to come down a little bit interest rates are going to go up but i don't think you'd go wrong with that super stock i don't think that's the car that you buy today and lose 15 20 percent of your value as soon as you you put 2,500 miles on it or, or take it off the dealer lot like a lot of cars, right? I I think, you're, I think you'd be fine with that car. So yes, but I, I, I think the way you do going, oh man, I mean, I can only really afford the one car and, you know, I, I'd like to get it. And then if I wait for, you know, Z06 or something to come out, can I even get it? Am I going to find something that's not crazy dealer markup? And am I going to lose my opportunity? It's a lot of rolling the dice. Yeah. But I will tell you this is how many times have we sat here and go, oh, I should have bought that a long time ago, or I missed that opportunity, or or this came up on Bring a Trailer, and I, I, you know, I didn't bid quite where I needed to go. And I'm not saying make irresponsible financial decisions. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know, man. It's just like, we never know how long we're going to be on this big blue marble. So why not just have some fun and get the car that you want? And it, it's fucking sell it. <laughs> if you don't sell it, you're not adopting a puppy. That's a commitment. You should keep that puppy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, listen, you bring a bird home from the ballpark. You're committed to that bird till that bird decides otherwise. <laughs> he has decided otherwise. All right, we now he's. Seen- uh, you know, it, but, but this is this is different. I get it. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's just so many missed opportunities. Like when when the sack car came up, when the when the Shelby American car came up, I saw cars going, and I'm like, man, I remember when these cars were new, and then ten years later they were traded for nothing. They were just hard to find, and now they're expensive. And I was like, yeah, but but I really want it, and I've got some money. And I'm gonna fucking buy it. You know, yeah. and I got it and I like it. And I look at it all the time and I go, hey, if I need to make a change or things happen, I could sell it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I could walk into that warehouse and go, well, at least I know there's some money sitting there that I invested and I can come in and yeah. I can look at it and enjoy it every day. And, yeah, and if I need that money, I could sell that car. But in the meantime, I, what am I going to do? Log onto my phone to my bank account and stare at it and go, oh, look at that money. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I've, blow money, but, but you know, you can't, you can't enjoy it. And, and if you've got a, You've got some money that you can at least invest in something that you think is fun and always, you know, be responsible and keep some money in the bank. Then go ahead and do that, you know. And but, enjoy it along the way. And enjoy it. And and look, I, I, you know, that was a decision for me going, you know what, I'm going to cut back on a few things and we're, we're, we're not taking a trip. And, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're postponing a vacation for another year because I want to be able to get this car. And I'm, I'm glad I got it, you know. Um, I don't know if this car is going anywhere, but I know Italy's not going anywhere. <laughs> so I could go there when I want. <laughs> I mean, last I heard, I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, I haven't been on the Reddit forums. Maybe something's going on with Italy. <laughs> but uh, good it's a way to look at it. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so anyway, that's just kind of it's kind of my thought. <laughs> it's kind of my thought there. I like the thought process. Um. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get things wrapped up. But I wanted to touch on is uh, GM announced a Blazer EV, and uh, it's it's good. Basically, their their competitor to the Mustang Mach E. They've got a little bit of time. They've had a little bit of extra time to kind of look at what the Mach E is doing as far as customer feedback and sales and enthusiasm, and they're trying to do that with Blazer. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't, I don't hate it. I kind of like the idea. Um, I like the idea of them doing a couple of performance based versions as well. Like we got with the Maki, we got a Maki GT, we got a Maki GT performance. You're going to be able to get, um, an SS model as well as a couple of others. You can get a front wheel drive an all wheel drive or a rear wheel drive. Uh, the SS model, we're looking at somewhere around 557 horsepower, 648 pound-feet of torque. GM hasn't given out official specs, but they're saying under four seconds, zero to 60. That's impressive. Uh, along the with that— part that's impressive to me is the styling. I, 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 thought it was, I thought it was a pretty decent-looking car. I, that's what I think, too, yeah. I, I, and I think it— I don't know. I kind of like it better than the current Blazer, the gas engine Blazer. I think they kind of dropped the ball. I don't think that resonated with customers. Um, and this this performance version you can get with, uh, you know, summer performance tires, 22-inch wheels, Brembo brakes, tuned suspension. Uh, and I think on this big version, the performance version, they're, they're, they're targeting around a 290-mile range uh, uh, on the EV. So mm-hmm. – in that regard, I think it's I think it's kind of interesting. I think it's um it's about sixty six thousand bucks. We'll see how that kind of falls with uh with the other ones in the lineup. There's gonna be lesser versions, probably around forty five thousand um, bucks. Uh, and then maybe maybe you know, forty five to fifty two, you know, there's gonna be an LT uh, version. There's going to be a, f- a few variations of it, an RS and an SS trim and a 1LT trim and a couple things like that. But yeah, I I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, I, you know, I like the idea of the nameplate. I like the Blazer nameplate. I think it's got an interesting look to it. Um, I think the performance specs are kind of interesting as well. We're, we're not really going to get a Camaro anytime soon that we know of. So we've got Corvette and then you know, on the performance side of things, in the world of super sedans and super SUVs, um, you know, a mid-priced, let's call it mid-priced, although everything feels like it's over $40,000 these days, but something in the fifty to $70,000 range, get a, a, a high-performance um, EV SUV, this is kind of interesting to me, you know? I, I it's cool looking, man. I didn't think that I would, and I, you know, because of the price point, I think it's going to be a great option for people. Uh, let's just see about in- charging infrastructure. That's all. Yeah, infrastructure and efficiency, and and all of the other things that we're going to start looking into. Uh, anyway, that uh, 
That being said, I think we're going to wrap things up for uh, for today. Uh, appreciate it, uh, you guys listening, as always. Uh, again, A&E, that's the documentary. You can see Goldberg up there. He's a WWE legend. You can watch it on the website. You can probably find it on uh, reruns on A&E. They've been playing that series quite a bit. So um, it was good. Great job. Great story. Uh, I think it's super interesting. And any of the podcast fans want to get a little inside look of where you've been the last uh, 20 years or so. <laughs> Uh, there you go. See what what, what Bill what Bill's been doing, other than podcasting. <laughs> yeah, the, the seed like three percent of what I've been doing for the last twenty years. <laughs> yeah, get a, <laughs> uh, you get what WWE thinks you've been doing for the last 20, 25 years. This is WWE's well, out okay. thought. Won't hurt. They they thought you hibernated for twelve years like a bear that you just came back because <laughs> that was kind of that was kind of a. Uh, and a story arc they were like I'm not going back into the ring 12 years later I'm back in the ring it's like well that took 19 seconds of the story <laughs> <What happened? laughs> yeah where did, where did he go he's like he's still there he's got a little more gray in his beard <laughs> yeah I was uh, in a cryo chamber yeah right alright guys alright thanks until next time keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. You own, you rent your home. Sure you do. And it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling your policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you have so much to do already around your home. Why not make it easy? Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All this month, stream the funniest films for free on Pluto TV. Watch comedy classics like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and Mean Girls. Or drop in for a Tyler Perry marathon with a Medea family funeral and Medea's witness protection. Pluto TV also has hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows like Get Shorty, Be Cool, Key and Peel, Comedy and Color, and more. And no contracts, no subscriptions, no fees, no joke. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start laughing today. Pluto TV, drop in, watch free.